Oh, good. All right. Omitofo to everyone. Clear out these goddess and we'll be there. Okay. Join palms and bow. The four great vows. I vow to deliver innumerable sentient beings. I vow to cut off endless vexations. I vow to master limitless approaches to Dharma. I vow to attain supreme Buddhahood. Welcome to you all. Um, tonight, we're um, going to change gears. And then again, we're not changing gears. It's what I've talked about many times, but it's time for us to go back to the practice itself. And, and I think it's always good to have this kind of a, uh, a class to make sure wh where we're at. And, and those who have just come on board have an opportunity to be able to, to um, experience uh, the methods of, of meditation in um, a more cohesive manner. Um, the beginning of this lecture, I probably have about 10 beginnings to it. Um, so it's not easy to, um, to know which one to start with. And as of, in, let's say five minutes ago, I changed it again. Um, there is no first point to start with. It, it is just uh, practicing um, with, with the idea of investigating mind. So we'll start with something that Master Shen Ying was talking about and talking about Manjusri. And um, when he was talking about Manjusri, uh, this was saying, Shen Ying renders the following teaching of Manjusri for entering Samadhi naturally through transcendent wisdom. So before we get to what he's going to say, we have to know what, what he just said. So, it, so it's talking about Master Shen Ying talking about entering into samadhi through a nat through uh, naturally through transcendent wisdom the word here samadhi is the um, ability of the mind to be able to to be in the present moment clearly aware not not shut down um not comatose um but clearly aware and not moving. And when we say not moving, there's a lot of misnomers in terms of this. And, and this is what ends up um, messing our practice up because when we talk about not moving, it's not so easy to know exactly what this not moving is. It was kind of like uh, Robert had said in the, uh, um, the Mind Work Forum, he reminded people about how uh, I discussed the master that said that uh, that the uh, the bridge was moving, but the but the water was still. And it's this kind of a let's put on the brakes, let's reverse it, and go. All right, that in our consciousness doesn't make sense to say that, how can we even possibly fathom that? But, but someone that has some experience will go, yes, it, it is in this way. Can it be explained with words? No, not really. I'm not even gonna try to do that. I, if, if that bugs you, work on it. You know, that's the reason he said it in that way. But it is impeccable in how it's said. This idea is, is that we cannot process, we cannot meditate with the cogitating mind um, that is attached to this consciousness, this egocentric consciousness. We have to let that go. But we always, when we sit on the cushion, bring it with us. And it just like, like teaching your dog, okay, don't, you know, um, don't uh, do anything wrong. And the dog's going, of course, I'm not going to do anything wrong. You're standing in front of me, but just wait till you don't look around. I'm going to see what I do. Yeah. And that happened once with my, my, one of my dogs where I went to get some milk and I laid out all of these donuts. They're like little donuts. So they're not as bad as big donuts. 
you know, unless you eat a hundred of them, which is possible. But I put them on my chair and lo and behold, when I came back, my dog had eaten them all but one that was in her mouth. And I'm just looking at her. She's looking at me going, I'm in so much trouble, but this is worth it. Then she went and she swallowed it. <laughs> and that's the way we are when we sit on the cushion. We just keep eating those little donuts. We, we can't put it down. And we know it's not good for us, but we still do that. We still hold on to these, these habitual patterns. <clears throat> so my kind bodhisattva dog, um, she actually, because she looked so pitiful in her way, she survived uh, um, a, a disciplinary action on it. She knew that she was, it, it was bad, but I mean, she, I don't know how she, she ate them so quickly. But in any case, our practice, when we sit on the cushion, we have to be aware of what we're doing. We can't let these little donuts keep coming in and, and vexing us. And we think we're there. Okay, calm down, calm down, you know. That one didn't hurt. I caught it early. I, I'm calm. Let's go back to it. No, you're the little donut too. All of that kind of this internal discussion is messing everything up. You, you really don't know how to sit to meditate. And you indulge yourself sitting there eating your, your donuts. No, at this point, you're not eating the big donuts anymore because those are visibly you could you could see those but you're eating these little tiny subtle thoughts that are arising and that's what messes you up when you try to meditate you you've got to let those go so what he's saying here is this samadhi is when you don't have these donuts that you're consuming they may be going by um and uh, uh and but you're not going to take them when I was very, very young, some of you who are uh, lack of hair um, or have wrinkles may remember, at least in, in the uh, U.S., if you went to a drive-in at, at intermission, there would have this thing where they'd go, let's all go to the lobby, and there'd be popcorn going by, donuts going by, drinks going by, a hot dog, all of these things are going by. And, and when you sit, it's like that. You're just watching this, this, these offerings coming by you, and, and they're all delicious, you know, um, but they, um, it, it is something that um, you, you have to let go. You can't indulge yourself, but you do every single time you sit down to meditate, you indulge yourself. And you think, what's the harm? But there's great harm in doing it this way because you're not doing the, the meditation right. If you did the meditation right, it's all there. But we don't do it right. When we sit there and, and we get happy because we didn't think for a, a minute or maybe even five minutes. And you go, whoa, I didn't have a thought for five minutes. That's pretty impressive. Actually, that's pretty impressive for a, a beginning meditator. But you're not a beginning meditator. you got to up your game. No, it's not just simply sitting there and, and being able to make it to the click, click, ding. No, even beginners can make it that far. They may be begrudging that they, their legs at that point, but yet they can still make it. So this is not a grand prize or a great prize. The great prize is, is to not be concerned whether the bell goes off or it doesn't go off because the mind is just simply in the state of samadhi. And it is here where naturally through transcendent wisdom, for entering samadhi naturally through transcendent wisdom. And what is the transcendent wisdom? We have wisdom. We know what wisdom is, or at least I hope you do. It's like, don't do the things that you, you're going to get busted for because you're, you're going to have to pay for it. You know, um, so 
the transcendent wisdom is a wisdom beyond wisdom. This is the Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi wisdom, this perfected wisdom. It's transcendent because what it does is it takes away the vexations and discriminations in the mind that are arising because of our fundamental ignorance of an ego, a life and being, or a personality. We have to, to not buy into that. Those are the little subtle donets that are coming up, not the images that are coming up, not a picture of the donut, but that which is attracted to it, that which keeps bringing it back up into mind. We need not purge the mind from this, but we have to be aware of it. And simply being aware of it is natural because it's the natural function of the mind. Our problem is that we, we really do not understand the potentiality of the mind. The potentiality of the mind is, is incredible. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and, and hopefully this will all begin to tie in. But what I'm wanting to do is kind of put you back on that cushion and say, what are you doing here? Okay. So you're there and say, you're meditating, kind of meditating. And here comes Gilbert in your mind. Are you really meditating? Or are you just eating these donuts? Get out of my head. What are you doing in here? I'm trying to help you. No, you're not. You just keep coming up in my mind. You're the one that brings me up in your mind. And you, you have to just let it go. And say, it's natural that I would hear his voice because, because I attune to the message that he's saying. So it would be natural that he would come into my meditation. I'm not really coming into your meditation. It's just a creation of the mind. But it's not a bad one because it's a reminder. A reminder, did you turn the oven off? Did you turn the heater off? Did you do whatever you had to do? All of these things are just reminders. And we, when, we, when we go there, we have to do a system analysis of, of when we're sitting there and we're beginning to meditate, if all those things are there. And I've gone over it before, all the elements that need to be there, irregardless of whatever meditation method you are. The first one is awareness. So we want to be aware of of what is arising in mind. And this awareness is a special awareness. It's not the awareness of the skanda or perception of the skanda. It's an awareness beyond that. We don't know that. We can't know that, but we can experience it. But when I say we can experience it, in fact, there's no we. No one is experiencing it. In order to experience it, there can be no we, no you, no, no I, me, or mine. Just mind. It's different. We have to be patient. I cannot conjure it up for you. I wish I could. I would change the world instantly. But it cannot go that way. Everything has to go in accordance with causes and conditions. Now we're ready to hear what, what um, Master Shen Yang was talking about Manjushri. Manjushri was saying, contemplate the five skanda, form, sensation, perception, volition, and consciousness, as originally empty and quiescent, not arising, not perishing, equal, that's equanimity, without differentiation, constantly thus practicing. So continuous practice, continuous. You have to, to be in this contemplation, in this awareness that you are contemplating. Thus practicing day or night, whether sitting, walking, standing, lying down, finally one reaches an inconceivable state without any obstruction or form. 
This is the samadhi of the one act. Now, this is what we could call a state, a mental state of the mind being stabilized. It is not enlightenment. It's still a mental state. It's very important, but it's not bad. It lives next door to enlightenment. So not bad, but you need to get to this into the neighborhood first. So now you're in the neighborhood in meditation. Your mind is calm. You have the, the samadhi there. So what else do you need? What do you think? Come on, you sages. What else after that is needed? Come on, this is not hard. I mean, this class is on silent illumination. So what is it that we lack? I'll give you guys five seconds to to pick some. Okay, Sam, go ahead. Hey, Gilbert, good to see you again. Um, I want to take a wild guess and say it's study. Study? That like was pretty wild. Nice. And... That was wild. <laughs> but no, that's okay. Tori, thank you, Sam. Go ahead. Uh, there you my go. guess is that to realize that it's all mine, that there's actually no lack. <laughs> it's all mine. Well, you're, you're getting warmer. I mean, when we're, if, what is this class on today? Come on, this is not like, you know, if you guys were doctors, and, and you had to reach this level to, to operate on somebody. I don't think I would let you open my head up. You're going to go, I should have said that. Because if there's silence with samadhi, what was that? Illumination. What are we studying today? Come on, you guys, this is going to go over the internet and they're going to show your faces and you're going to say, wow, that guy really doesn't know what he's talking about. How come these people don't understand that there's illumination? That's why samadhi is not uh, enlightenment. There has to be illumination. Some of you from a Theravadan background would call it vipassana, right? So, it's, so there's illumination of the mind. This is a key to all of this. Because when we do this, we have to have the ability to, to understand that it has to be balanced, this quietness of the mind and the illumination of it. But what is the illumination of the mind? What do you think? Anybody have an idea? I mean, the rookies are coming forward and taking a shot, and that's good. Yes, Paul, go ahead. Go ahead. The uh, pure awareness, the mind reveals itself to itself. That's the illumination? The Sitting illumination. pure awareness? So there's this awareness in the mind. Awareness of what? Of itself, of mind. The mind being yep. aware of itself. And what would that encompass? A dissolution of a self, a being, a life, and a personality? Well, that, that is a, a good start, yes. The, the idea here is, is that, and I'm putting you, I'm just kind of pushing the fork, fork in further to see if it's rare in the middle or, or, or done. But, um, but yeah. I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's see who was next. Frank. Okay. Hi, um, well, my current understanding is that when we're being aware of awareness itself, we're observing the thoughts and the patterns and the habits, you know, and in this way we can see basically what samsara of the mind is and using right view, we can determine whether or not something needs to be uprooted or pursued or not pursued. And 
the entire time, as long as we're objective about it, we don't attach to it. And then that way you don't, uh, it's conservation of energy almost. Okay. So now it's clearly illuminated, you can just allow it to come and it's not affecting you and you can make the decision clearly. Okay. Now we'll take it up another notch. Can, and then I'll, I'll get back to you, Harry, unless you want to take it. Can anybody confess Frank's sin? Nobody. There must be some roaming Catholics around. Yes, Eon, go ahead. Um, there was a lot of separation, like something was viewing something else. Like we are seeing, we are aware of. Yes. So there is a, a, a dualistic set of understandings baked into it. And, and this is the sin that's made when people sit to meditate, that they have this mindset in this way. Thank you very much, Ian. They have this mindset in this way where, where people thinking that, all right, I need to quiet down, I've quieted down, or whatever. But it isn't in this way. We have to have the self-absorption into the self-nature. These are not two things. It is the realization that there is no ego personality or life and being um, that is there. And this absorption into mind. The samadhi sets the table for us. The illumination enables us to utilize this pure and perfect um, mind without discrimination. It is what you're doing when you're sitting on the cushion practicing sign illumination. I was going to start with, uh, you know, one of the poems from Master Hong Tzu and, and talking about silent ponds and autumn nights and I was going to say furry clad trees, but snowy clad trees and the moon and the egret and stuff. That doesn't help you. That just makes you there waxing poetic, thinking, oh, this is so wonderful. Get off the cushion. It's not like that. It's like, like it, you're, you're settling too, too low in terms of this. You have to really aspire. Don't, don't be settled for just the fact that your legs stop hurting you, right? There should be more to it than that. Harry, we'll go back to you. Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to make one point in this, in this discussion about illumination. So in uh, Song of Mind, Shurfu makes the point that illumination is not a great term. And he uses the example of taking a flashlight and shining it at a wall and says that the light doesn't go through the wall, right? So that illumination, the way that we normally understand it, is confusing. So it really is, uh, you know, an aware awareness and suchness itself. And, and that awareness does go through the wall. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And, yes. and that's the difference. And so that, that's a good analogy or good way of looking at it, because if we try to become enlightened, in, in fact, where are you going to pin that on? Because like, you go before the Buddha, and you're going, where am I going to pin this on? What do you mean? Should I put in, pin it on myself? Because I'm the Buddha. But, but I'm the one that's enlightened. Are you really? Where would I put it on you? Well, pin it on my chest. But you're not real. What do you mean I'm not real? I can feel everything. Wake up. Poof. And, and so... It is a different way I want of looking at things. This is why I wanted to approach this illumination from a more challenging way to look at it. So we don't get caught up in all of these romanticized versions of what mind is. Because when I started reading, I said, oh, this sounds so good. The only problem is everybody's going to be there going like, wonderful, you know, hey, Uncle Gilbert, read us another story that I like that one. It's not that way. Well, maybe I'm Grandpa Gilbert to some of you. Uh, 
but but in any case, it isn't in, in this way. We we really have to look. I'm I'm doing my best to lace this all together, but you knowing that the clock's going like that very quickly. So let me continue on. I haven't gotten to not even one percent of the content I was um, going to read on. And this is just a, a little aside from a um, a llama, but I love this uh, because the manner in which he writes it is so um, calm and clear. He says, if there's something you truly want to know, then you truly want to listen to your own wisdom. You know, meditation is learning how to listen with your own wisdom so that you can see. I think why meditation is amazingly important is that somehow our unconscious world is much bigger. It is huge, universal. We don't understand that one. Meditation allows this world to be light and knowable, understandable. That is why it is important. Normally, we are totally robbed by the egotistical conventional mind, not allowing the fundamental mind to be functioning. That is why one should have confidence, truly through experience, through experience. One has confidence in one's spiritual journey. It is in this way, as we practice, we gather and gain experience. We don't collect it like we're collecting money in a bank. We just utilize the mind in the proper way, investigating and we bump into these donuts, but we just go through them. They're transparent and we let them go. It is in this way that we, we gain experience. Huh? It's like, like um, a ghost passing through you. Anybody ever have a ghost pass through you? Hmm. It's a very interesting sensation because it goes shoot it gives you a little shiver but it's gone but you know it, it cannot harm you and so so you're not feared by it you're not attracted by it you're not looking for something you can't see you would just continue on your way in perfect functioning and if you need be you you can say um um recitation or blessings to let that being pass on. But the thing is, is that we do not allow it to affect our environment. We, our true nature, our true nature is the environment. It is the environment that is created. We only know the bubble in the stream. We don't know the vast. We don't know like what this Lama was saying, huge, universal. We don't understand that, but it's there. When we sit to meditate, it is there. We just have to, to let go, let go of the self and sit, sit and rest and just rest in that moment and rest and rest. And don't be looking at the clock. Don't be hoping for the bell to go off. Don't be worrying about whether your leg is going to hurt you. It probably will, but it's okay. As I mentioned many times in my retreats, I've never had anybody die from the leg pain. Although may, many of them might have wanted to have committed a homicide on me for having them sit there. Uh, but it, it isn't in this way. It's okay. We continue on.
This is from an article on Soto Zen ancestors, uh, quite a long article, so I can't go through everything, but there's this one part I think that might be helpful. The Chan literature is in reality a symbolic expression of it. Almost all Chan statements originating with any sect or master point to uh, one of the three general Mahayana positions, the theory of emptiness from the Prajnaparamita Sutras and the Madhyamika literature, the theory of thusness or non-duality, and the theory of the Tathagata Garbha or Buddha essence, what I call Buddha nature or the self nature of mind, which has been commonly translated from Chinese into English as Buddha nature. Well, there you go. Um, so in the one, the emptiness, sunyata, is the Mahayana Buddha's perception that all phenomena, physical and mental, is impermanent and that none exist independently of, of others. However, this is understood not simply as a metaphysical statement. It's just not, we just don't say, oh, everything is empty. Okay, well, that's good. What is good does that do? Nothing. Um, it's not just simply a metaphysical statement about reality, but also, and more importantly, the object of intuitive awareness, the object of intuitive awareness. So when we say this, this is a, this object without a subject to it. It is the intuitive awareness of the mind. There's no duality here. It is how the mind functions, this intuitive awareness. Why do we call it intuitive? Because we can't feel it. We can't, we can't conjure it up. I want to be a, way, a wisely sage. I want to be smart. I want to, to do that. You can't bring it up. No matter how you try to bring it up, come up wisdom, come up wisdom. It won't come up in that way. Just be still. Be still. Be aware. Listen. Contemplate. It's right there. Like the Theravadan said, Liberation at the palm of your hand. It's right there. We don't know that. But it is this intuitive awareness when we're sitting and meditating, we are tapping into that intuitive awareness. That's important. If you're not practicing in this way, get off the cushion until you understand this or, or you know how to practice. You'll do fine. You'll be good. And I'll say, oh, Gilbert told everybody not to meditate. No, it isn't that way. I'm, I'm being theatrical about my admonitions. I'm, I'm just telling you that it is critically important. If you really want to do this right, then you do it right. And you tap into this intuitive awareness. It cannot be picked up from a book. You have to experience it. The only way you can experience it is just like what Manjushri said, every moment you tap into it. Every moment you keep this awareness. Okay, and then he says, in other words, emptiness is additionally an experience. Experience. Um, lost my place, sorry. Um, reminder, don't read things with such fine print at the end of the day. Okay. Um, uh, emptiness is additionally an experience, one which can oh, be... Oh, there I, I was reading too far up. You, you're on to me. One which can be realized and actualized through uh, meditation. So... Emptiness is, is additionally an experience which can be realized and actualized through meditation. If you do it right, it can be realized. If you do the meditation right, 
Not bad. So I'm not telling you get off the cushion. I'm telling you get on the cushion and get on, on the proper uh, method. The term thusness, tathata, um, often translated as suchness in English, appears for the first time, and appeared for the first time in the Prajnaparamita Sutras, and it refers to the uh, the way in which phenomena exist priori before conceptualizing, and any form of subject or object uh, discrimination occurs in relation to them. It is the inherent state of the apparent reality viewed. So, so this thusness of things is that when we see something happening, we know from where it comes. And you're there and you go, I got a ticket. Blank, blank cop. I can't believe he did that. There were so many people going fast. And, no, now you're off of it. You just go, I got a ticket. I wasn't aware enough. All right, put it down. Pay the ticket. Move on. Don't try to overthrow the government because you got a ticket. Don't get angry at the cop because you got a ticket. There's plenty of other things you get angry over. But don't get angry about that. You see that occurring, and then we add the extra onto it. It's like this little donut, and we want to add and make it a bigger donut and put glaze on it and sugar sprinkles or whatever else, and we mess it all up. It was just originally what it was. Causes and condition never fail, but we're ignorant to that, so we add more and more to it. Now the donut becomes bigger in the future. When you see a cop, you're going to say, you know, blank to the cop because you got a ticket before and that keeps coming up in your head that messes up everything that you see but if you just see the dustness and then you say oh, i have this feeling about the cop then you understand from where it came then you're okay but if you're sticking to those thoughts then that's what messes things up the important part here is to know that this mind that is seeing all of this there are not two minds. There's just the one. But in the one, there is the, um, the ignorance of a personality, ego, or a life and being that keeps coming up and dictating what you're going to do in the next moment. If you let go of that, as you let go of it when you're sitting to meditate, then the mind is liberated. Why? Because it's naturally liberated. It doesn't have to, to, uh, to do something. If, if you go to the ocean and you get a, a glass of, of salt water, you don't go, oh, you know what this needs? This needs salt. <laughs> no, it doesn't need salt. You know, maybe if you're a Mexican, you, you put a lot of salt on things, but but it doesn't need salt. But we we think it needs something or need to take something out of it. It isn't in that way. It's just naturally what it is. And when you understand that, you see that all there, whether the water is seen as pure or salty or whatever, it is just the way it is. If you go to the river and you drink the water there then you, um, it, it tastes pure and clear. Of course, you may have drank some organisms that will keep you going, <laughs> but that's something else. Cause and condition never fail. But the thing is, we know from where we got that. We know that everything is just the way it is. And, and this is important when we sit to meditate. I'm... I'm telling you things that almost seem obvious, right? But when we sit on the cushion, they're not obvious. And it's what keeps us from getting there. Okay. Um, the t Okay, I talked about that part.
I'm going to stop there because it goes into a deeper part that I don't want to go into right now. Um, I'm just kind of giving you snippets of things. Um, this is now we get to Hong Zhe. Hong Zhe is, is the man on, on sign illumination. And in this part, um, he's talking about the bright and boundless field. And I'm just giving you some things to, to, to kind of chew on. The field of boundless emptiness is what exists from the very beginning. You must purify, cure, grind down, and brush away all of the tendencies you fabricated into apparent habits. Then you can reside in the clear, bright, clear circle of brightness. This part always bothered me a bit. Um, and, and I don't know whether it was a translation error or not, uh, but this idea that we have to pure, pure and grind down or brush away these tendencies rather than to see through them. I, I would prefer them to have seen, to see through these things, to see that they are causes and conditions. We are not actively trying to brush away things, but this is the reason I bring this up because I don't want you to do that on the cushion. You don't have to brush things off. Utter emptiness has no image. Upright independence does not rely on anything. Just expand and illuminate the original truth, unconcerned with external conditions. What is the original truth? If you're going, somebody asked you, what is the original truth? What would you say to them? Nobody knows the original truth. I mean, you can guess at it, you know. Tori, so rookie comes up again. Go ahead. Buddha nature. Buddha nature. Okay, that's what. All right, Sam. Oh, hold on, Jessica. Uh, yeah, go I ahead. was going to say either n no thing, nothing, or mine. Well, is mine nothing? No thing, like no no singular thing, maybe, no, or it is no thing. All right, you're 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 kind of dancing around the the edge of it. Okay, anybody else? What is the original truth? The the thing that you is indisputable. Nobody. Wrong Chen. Welcome. Buddhism uh, Baba. A cause condition never fail. Causes and conditions never fail, which is the, the mind. Yes, that's that. You see, there, there's not just one answer here. These are original truths. Causes and conditions never fail because that's the definition of the Buddha mind. Robert, if you say cause and condition never fail, I'll cut your beak off. <laughs> Everything is mine. Everything is mine. To know all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future perceive that all Dharma, Dadu, nature, all phenomena is created by the mind. Everything's created by the mind. So if it's created by the mind, it is mind. It can't be in any other way. It belongs to the mind, although it is an apparent truth. The absolute truth is to know that it's created by the mind. The mind creates it. The phenomena cannot create. Do you understand? Bah, have a cup of tea then. You have to see the difference. Frank. There you go. Uh, oh, my dog almost knocked over. So if this is in the way that like, you know, I look at a cup and regardless of the true nature of the cup, my mind is what is presenting that to me. So in this way, you know, it's being manufactured internally by the time I've already perceived that it exists. But we know that it's not your mind, just mine. 
Yeah, you know, right. Like, but I use the words I, we, me, mine to describe because I'm using language. But even as I'm sitting on the cushion, staring at the floor and watching things flow by and seeing the pieces come and go, it's like when you're aware of the awareness, your perception shifts a little and you understand there really is only one singular self and a component might leave, but you're still the same self. And that other thing that left is a different self and it might return. And now the self is, you know, a different form of it again, but it's all this reminds me of the line of Tara, and I had a question on it, but, you know, two minutes ago when you confessed my sins, I think you answered it because in the line of Tara, with the repository consciousness, I had a, you know, I had to come here and ask, am I understanding this correctly? Is this because it's the vehicle that is storing everything? And if I'm only looking at this from the mundane point of view, then it'd be like, okay, this form, this body, all the skandhas and the awareness of the awareness and the awareness of the awareness of the awareness. Well, whatever is thinking of this and understanding this is the repository. If I wanted to go to the super mundane, fine. Then whatever is contained outside of that is also that repository. But I have no idea because you're the only one that I can come to to ask if I'm in the right pet direction or not. So I'm very excited that you're talking about this today. Thank you. No, no problem. It, it's just that when I say, uh, "Can anyone confess Frank's sins?" and then all of a sudden the, you know, the hair on the back of your neck goes up. You know, but. I apologize if if you felt oh, no, something from that, but but it is essentially what from the mast ancient masters to say when someone is saying something they're really trying hard, but they are they are looking at things from the wrong viewpoint, and so it is uh, it is on the well known advisor to bring those uh, to, to your attention, because that's exactly what we're doing here. We're fine tuning, we're, we're, we're going, okay, we got on the cushion, we're on the method, we're doing this, we're crossing our legs, but what are we doing? Let's fine tune this, this practice to, to get better at it. So we don't make mistakes when we're on there. And so this will all come up. So it's okay, you're in the right place, you're asking the right questions, you know, with that. And, and, um, oh, yes, I'm not insulted by confessing my sins. Why would I, <laughs> not, I? I'm not Jesus. I have sins. I'm not perfect. That's okay. I'm just wondering if what I said is right understanding or not. Yes and no. I mean, the thing is, is that when you have this dualistic viewpoint, mm -hmm. then that you have to be mindful you're in a Chan class and, and, and you you have to adjust because it is this kind of adjusting of the mind, the training of the mind that enables you to cultivate and investigate properly. You can't be sloppy with it. And so, so, uh, so just, just bear that in mind so in the keep, future. Like okay. you said last time around, you have to keep, you know, bringing it back and uh, remembering. Okay. I understand. I think, thank okay. you. All right, let me continue on. But essentially, the, the essence of the mind is that everything's created by it. And that's where you, where it fits with Nagarjuna's two truths of the apparent reality and the absolute reality. But we cannot separate those things. But when we sit, we don't try to separate them. We don't try to separate the sacred from the profane when we're sitting um, on the cushion. We just are there. And we, we're, we're aware, we're aware of everything around us, but we are not taking the bait in terms of chasing after ego. Okay, we continue on. I think if I kept going, perhaps by the end of the week, I would finish all of this if I just spoke straight through. Okay. Um. This is from the Platform Sutra, uh, the Sixth Patriarch, Hui Neng. And he says, the men of the, world men of the world, separate yourself from views. Do not activate thoughts. If there were no thinking, then no thought would have no place to exist. No is the no of what? No. Thought means thinking of what? No is a separation 
from the dualism that produces passions. Thought means thinking of the original nature of true reality. So this thinking of original nature of true reality. And how do you think of the original nature of true reality? By not thinking. What? That's what he said, right? And um, if you give rise to thoughts from your self, true self nature, then although you see, hear, perceive, and know, you are not stained by the manifold environments and are always free. So in actuality, he's, when he's saying no thought, he's not saying no thought. He's saying you're not giving rise to attaching thoughts. When we talk about akusala thoughts versus kusala thoughts, these, you're not attaching to things, and that is the, the wu nian or no, no thinking. It's not that you blank your mind and they go, oh, what happened to Gilbert? Oh, he's in Wu Yin. What do you mean he's in Wu Yin? He's not thinking, you know, and say, what's the difference between that and a drug induced comatose coma? Nothing. No, it's not that way. It is that there is no sticky thoughts, no attaching thoughts is what he's saying. This this very mind is your true nature. This is the Buddha mind. But we are always sticking to things. We go through life like a tar baby. Remember from the <laughs> Uncle Remus uh, yes. uh, ancient stories, you know, the tar baby. And, and, and nobody wanted to hold the tar baby because they would stick to them. And that's the way we are. We go around life sticking to this person. Somebody says, hi. And we go, I love you and forever. And somebody says, hi. And you say, I love you forever. You're just like a tar baby, whatever it is. Oh, this, this candy is good. I want more. This donut is good. I want more. This alcohol is good. Whatever it is, we're just sticking and sticking and sticking to it. We, we need not be that way. We just see the things. We can taste the strawberry, but not desire the entire strawberry plant. It's okay. You can in enjoy a strawberry. You can experience pain. It's okay. That comes with the territory. There's nobody in, in this group that has never experienced pain, right? If anybody has gone through their life up to this point and never had a painful moment. A pain of the body, pain from the heart. We all have. We do that. It is what, where we practice. If we cannot practice in those times, how can we do it? If we cannot practice when there's good things happening, that too is our time to practice. We don't get too excited. We just keep it level, even. Um, and this is from young Chia and he's saying having forgotten all involvements one is silent and still yet luminous wisdom by nature is incisively penetrating Dark and cognizant, it still shines and illuminates while conforming to primal and true emptiness. One all the while perceives with the precise uh, exactness. This is a state of a mind that's still, that's, that has a calmness to it, a clarity to it. It, it is a functioning mind. It doesn't function for the benefit of an ego or a life in being. It functions for all sentient beings and in harmony 
with all sentient beings. So it says all of these passages from the early Chan patriarchs are examples of teachings that could be the precursors of the practice of silent illumination. One is silent and still yet illuminates while conforming to primal and true emptiness one all the while perceives with precise exactness. It's clear, precise exactness. This is how we, we see things, not from the idea of we, but we as collectively the singular Buddha mind. So Tongshan, um, one of the founding fathers from whom the school takes its name, once remarked, one should not think about anything at all while practicing Chan. One should not go east or go west, but go directly to the place where 10, 000, for 10,000 miles around, not one blade of grass, there's not one bl blade of grass, and then you will get it. So the blades of grass are are these sticky thoughts. And so if you went out, if I walked out to my um, front door, I have a lawn. So there's all sorts of blade of grass. So if I if I I'm walking on it, I'm walking in all of these blades of grass. The, the difference is is that when one is walking, I'm aware that I'm walking in these, and I'm not holding on to any single blade of grass. It is just seen as the function of walking or whatever I'm going to do. Where are we at? I think I'll stop there. I've, I've got a lot more to go um, and some really, really interesting stuff coming up in terms of, of um, what we're we're going to discuss later on but what i want to do is give you an opportunity to have a chance on the cushion to be able to meditate uh and so this is you know sometimes people say oh gilbert he doesn't talk about the practice of course i talk about the practice you no know, but in terms of talking about the practice and meditation you also have to have foundationally what's there now i'm taking all that foundation and bringing it back to the cushion to make it meaningful so when you're sitting. So now during this week, have a few sessions of sitting in sign illumination and see how it feels. See if it feels different. And we go from there and then and then we'll keep working on this. Um, so this is our chance to work on sign illumination. Some a lot of retreats are coming up. So this is a good time to kind of like uh, do some spring cleaning. OK. So there's where we're at. OK. I'll open it up to questions. Yes, Sam. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, and thank you for today's lecture. Um, I actually realized I knew very little to nothing about silent illumination in the Soto school. So Thank you for the education as well. But I did have a question. I always get really excited when you uh, reference the Platform Sutra. It's really the one that, you know, uh, I guess there's really no words to describe that, but I think you know. But I did have a question on Master Hui Nang saying, but if you don't think any thoughts at all, the moment you make your thoughts stop, you are imprisoned by dharmas. We call this a one-sided view. And I think my question is, is how how does one become imprisoned by dharmas if they are empty? Um, because we, we have to uh, be mindful of what uh, Hui Neng is saying when he's talking about Wu Nian or, or no thought. His, his idea of Wu Nian and no thought is not that one does not um, uh, develop thought. It is simply that one uses functional thought to perform functions, but we we do not uh, give rise to the ego or personality or life and being thoughts, which are sticky thoughts. So so if it 
happens, then that thought is in the present moment. And, and one is aware of that thought. But as soon as one says it, then it, it's gone. And so this is the thing. But if we try to purge the mind from thought, then what happens is, is that uh, we get into a, a difficult um, moment because by trying to purge the mind from thought, um, we end up in what's called the devil's cave, which is just a dead place. There's nothing happening. There's no lights on, nobody's home, nothing. And it, it, it's of no benefit. And when one comes out of that, there is no benefit to it. There's no illumination there. And that's the difference. It's very, very important. And these classes that I'm saying right now are by and large for some of the beginners and also from the real advanced students. But they're for you, they're for Frank, they're people that, that are coming in and, and don't have experience with this to give you a chance at it. So yeah, please pay attention as you're doing and, and you'll find. In, in the Platform Sutra, look up Wo Lun. Um, there's a story about Wo Lun and, and Wo Lun was, was, um, wrote a poem that said, Wo Lun has skill. You know, every day he cuts off thoughts and every day the Bodhi is growing in him. And then Hui Neng said, this this verse does not reflect the correct right view. And so he Hui Ning said then um, that uh, Hui Ning has no skills. He, he has thousands of thoughts a day, okay? And the Bodhi is just like this. And so you need to kind of see the difference between that. So try to find that and, and look that up, okay? And it's in the Platform Sutra, so... So that will help you a lot to understand um, that. And, and, and what you're saying is very, very common because people will look at it and go, I don't understand that. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt for that one as well. So I understand where you're at, okay? Been a long time, but, but I, I remember that situation. So thank you, Sam. Uh, thank, thank you, Gilbert. Thank you. Yeah, because yeah, you, you speak for the novices and that's good. And, and I'm always trying to take care of the novice. Okay. Being a novice is fun because it only means you get to keep going. And that's uh, right. Only you to achieve, right? Absolutely. So, okay, let's go. I think Tori was next and or Harry was next. Harry was next. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Hi, Gilbert. I just wanted to read something into the record. That, that is, <laughs> this, this is, is like a congressional hearing. <laughs> it's a congressional right. <laughs> I have a, a, I want to retain you as my attorney also, as I say this. Um, you're, you're like that Congressman Raskin that's <laughs> being on the Republicans. I'm not saying what, whether I'm Republican or Democrat, but I'm just mentioning right. him because so you, you I just come wanted, to mind. Yes, um, it's a quote from um, the Sutra, The Practices of Samantabhadra. And in the beginning of the Sutra, Ananda Mahakashapa and, and um, Maya Trey are asking questions, and they're definitely heavy headed hitters. Excuse me, what was it, the sutra again? Sutra of um, the practices of Samantabhadra. It's the last. Okay. It's the it's the sutra that follows the Lotus Sutra. Yeah. Right? So they're talking. They're talking about aspiring um, bodhisattvas. So there are a number of questions, but the last two are, are really relevant, I think, to what you're um, talking about. And then I'll. Go to the, uh, there's a passage from the end, but they say, um, how, he's talking about aspiring bodhisattvas. How, without cutting off their delusions and renouncing their five desires, can they also purify their sense faculties and completely eliminate the accumulated karma of their wrongs? And with only the pure ordinary eyes received at birth from their parents, and without forsaking their five desires, how can they see things unaffected by their impediments? So then the, the rest of the sutra is uh, a lot of it is about remorse and acknowledgement of remorse. But then um, 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 by the end, wait, did I just, um, let's see. Uh, oh, I just lost the page. Wait. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, bo so uh, finally, the Buddha says, Bodhisattva practice is neither cutting off the bindings of delusions nor sinking in the sea of delusions. 
Contemplate the mind and you will see that it is no mind. It merely arises from distorted thoughts. A mind with such attributes arises from illusions, just like the wind blows through the sky with no foothold in empty space. Inherently, such attributes of things are neither produced nor extinguished. What is an offense? What is a virtue? Since our minds are themselves emptiness, offenses and virtues have no host. So it is also with all things which do not abide or perish. So I just thought that that's kind of coming from the view of, that you were talking about today. The sun illumination. It's, yeah, it's sun illumination. I mean, that's what, that's, that's what I'm talking about, you know. So I'm, I'm always so happy to have you, you know, in the class and to give um, another perspective, which is essentially the same perspective and you see it in, in different ways. But it is in this way where we sit, we don't try to cut off thought. We don't try to change thought. We don't try to reach anywhere or to escape from anywhere. We just see, as I had mentioned earlier, the thusness or suchness of mind. And that's important. We really have to contemplate that as to the thusness and suchness, you know. And and if you really want to 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 make progress, you 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 practice in this way. If you want to be a good citizen, then you practice the paramitas uh, from the samsaric side. But if you want to um, to save sentient beings, then you reflect the paramitas from the mind side. So thank you very much. Okay, Tori, where'd you go? See, everything is empty. She, I think she disappeared by accident. All right. Well, Tori, if you're there, if you come back, then we'll we'll get you back in. Any any questions? Oh, there she is. Okay. Sorry, I right. lowered my hand too fast, and then I guess I disappear into another screen or something. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, I, I think this this. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, this session really helped me to kind of link up different ideas that to have like even more detailed understanding. So I just want to confirm that my understanding, I'm, I'm on the right path here. Um, the, um, you're talking about the thirstness, right? Tataka. And, and that in Chinese, it's the meaning of it is that there's no coming and going. And coming and going is is the, the impermanence and backed up by causes and conditions. That's why it's coming and going. It's not permanently always here. Um, so when we're sitting on the cushion, the first thought that rises up um, to, is to recognize that this thought here is backed up by causes and conditions. So we don't go with that. When we go with that and if thinking more of it, it's that kind of like what you were saying is adding salt to that salt water so that we add more causes and condition and 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 it it would so we would be lost in the um in the impermanence. So therefore it's not going to be as clear as uh it's not going to be um uh we, we would not be able to have that awareness that how mind works, that there is no causes and conditions with not, well, uh, that causes and conditions does not create the mind, but it's the other way around. So I don't know if that my understanding is correct. Yeah, it when, when you sit, don't think too much, okay? Just simply when, when you sit, relax. And I'll go through the elements again later on in terms of it, but relaxation is very important. Awareness is important. Contemplation is important to learn how to contemplate. And in the next few sessions, I will talk about contemplation again. Um, but when you, you sit, the mo chow is, is very, very simple, you know, because what does the word mean in Chinese? Uh, silently illuminating the mo chao, mo, mo chao. yeah, it's, silently it's, observing, or I guess another was the, the, the direct translation of it. Wei Shan, you're there. 
our resident translator from China. Can you can you put hook him up before he falls asleep? No, it's morning over there. Okay, go ahead. So Mo Chao or Mo Sao, how do you say it? Oh, Mo Chao, it's just, it, it, it is uh, silence. It, that's the Mo, and uh, Chao is, is uh, illumination. illumination. Illumination, okay. That's kind of interesting because I, I thought it meant uh, just sitting. So how do you say just sitting in Chinese? Oh, uh, that's, yeah, it, 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 just sitting, yes. Yeah, because our school is really uh, just sitting. So when you sit, Tori, just, you just sit. Um, and, and it's like um, this day and age is very great because we have like self-cleaning ovens, right? I don't know if they still have them or not. They used to be a big thing about 30 years ago. Uh, maybe they still have them I don't know but you just put on the thing and it it turns up the heat very very high and then when it does and all of the all of the crust inside your oven falls off and then you just sweep it out very naturally and the same thing is when we sit to meditate we don't have to scrub we don't have to do anything to make the the mind pure the mind is fundamentally pure we start from this viewpoint, this is right view. So when you sit, you don't have to have a thought, oh, I should be thinking about this, or I should be thinking about this, or I should put my mind here. You just sit, okay? So if somebody said, your job for the rest of your life is just to sit on this bench, then you just sit on the bench. So if they say, if you sit on the bench, you know, for eight hours a day, you know, we'll give you a million dollars. And you go, wow, that's a pretty good deal. You know, I just sit on this bench for eight hours a day and just sit and I get a million dollars. But what if I said, if you sit on that bench and you can get as many of the, the sands and the Ganges River, if all of those were Ganges rivers and all those collectively, those sands were treasure chests, it still wouldn't amount to the same value of just sitting. It's precious, incredibly precious because it gives you the way out of this dream. And more precious than that is that once you realize that, then you don't have an interest in leaving the dream as much as you have an interest in, in awakening others. Incredible preciousness there. And so when we sit and we sit in the right way, that should be motivation for you. Motivation enough for everyone to be able to sit in this way and, and have this incredible preciousness of sitting properly. But we don't do that. We, we go, oh my God, now I got to sit again. You know, and, oh, my legs are hurting me and my back is hurting me and I'm not happy with my job. Who, who brought your job into it? But you bring it in. I'm not happy with this. You know, I fought with my boyfriend, girlfriend, mother, dog, whatever it is, all these different things that can come up that, that are there. No, you just sit. You just sit. All those things are, go passing by naturally through your mind, but you don't have to, to deal with them in that moment. You're just sitting. And so when you learn that, and, and then you just keep to the present moment. Everywhere, just like, that's why I started with Manjushri saying that in every moment, whatever you do, you stay in awareness of the present moment. So when you get to the cushion, it's natural. If, if you do that, then it's natural for you to be able to practice in the proper way because you're already doing it through the day and not bad. That's called liberation. So this is very important. You, you can't buy that in the store. And if you go to Rodeo Drive and try to buy it, they'll go, ha ha, are you kidding me? If I could sell that, I could sell it for a billion dollars. No, it's free. And I freely give that to all of you, offering it to you. What a wonderful gift. What a wonderful gift Master Shen Yang 
provided me with. And all I can do is just pass it forward. So just in this way, then we do things. So Ruth Marie, did you just put a heart up? <laughs> wow, that I didn't see how that went, but that's that was pretty cool. Um, but yes, it's, it's just in this way. So if you practice this way, don't, Tori, don't think about anything when you're sitting there. Just let the mind rest. Rest in the awareness. Learn how to do that. Learn, and we'll talk more about contemplation uh, in a later session. And, and this contemplation is very, very um, um, useful. But we don't understand that. We confuse contemplation with cogitation. Or, you know, like the Rodin's thinker that's there going, oh my gosh, I have the weight of the world on me. I'm so worried about everything. No, it's not that way. But if, if the Rodin's uh, thinker, I would say, relax. Put your hands like this. Relax, just sit. You don't have to be so worried about everything in the world. Too much thinking makes the mind very, very tired. Okay, other questions? Yeah, anything else, Tori? Okay. Other questions? Vadim, I had you on my mind. Um, hi, Gilbert. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, just wanted to clarify my understanding. Uh, it so happens that I'm also listening uh, to the lectures of your Dharma brother, uh, Guo Xing Pashi. And he was recently talking about uh, the second thought grasping the first thought. I was just wondering uh, if it is the same uh, that you meant by saying that the first thought is undefiled but as soon as we start to build on it uh, and uh, mm, generate second thought and so on thoughts about it, then that's where the defilement comes in. And we sort of uh, try to stop this process. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, it's kind of like, let's say you were going like this and and it naturally becomes nam amitofu, nam amitofu, nam amitofu. But if you start thinking about it and you go, that one wasn't that good. Or let me back up and do it again. Or let me cling to this one. That was a good one. Then you mess everything up. So it isn't necessarily that, that the second thought is a bad thought. It is that those thoughts naturally are connected in order to perform the function. This is a very good question um, um, about this. Because what he means by that is, is that that second thought, it doesn't have to be defiled. It doesn't have to be a clinging thought. It can be just me speaking to you and engage in no thought. So engaged in no thought is just simply one thought follows another thought follows another. We don't cling to it. We don't say, oh, that was a good thought. That was a good point. That was this. It simply comes out naturally like a river. But the moment that we cling to that second thought, we defile that thought because now there is a locus for that thought, a location of it. And that locus is the ego. It is emanating from the ego. And, it, and the ego is sticking to that thought. And it's slowing the whole process down because you want to go, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, let let's let me hold that thought, or you hold that. No, I don't tell people to hold the thought. Let it go. Really move it. Okay, and so so when it isn't that the second thought is bad naturally, it is it is the second thought is defiled naturally by the clinging to the ignorance of that there's an ego or life and being that that second thought is important more important than the original thought. And so that's it. So if I say, oh, a donut, and then you look at it and you go, I want it. I want it. I want the donut. And um, 
And so I remember originally when I would bring up donuts with Chinese people in, in the United States, they'd go, ooh, donut, yuck, yuck, yuck. And now after 20, 30 years, they go, mm, that so, sounds so good. You know, they've been corrupted by us. I feel so bad that, that we've infused them with this discrimination of the donut. But, but it is the ego that clings to that, you see. But that's why when I was talking to Frank, where it said that, uh, where Wo Lun was saying, you cut off the thoughts. And um, Hui Ning was saying, no, you don't cut off the thoughts. You give rise to thousands of thoughts a day. You, you, you see it in this way. You, you just don't hold on to the thought. So the thoughts go by. Since I've started uh, lecturing, I've had thousands of thoughts. But in fact, I've had no thought. It is just this way. And you go, how is that? And how is it not? How is it that you cannot do that? But you can do it. You can do it. You just have to practice, to practice, to let go of things. If I'm constantly thinking about Gilbert's reputation or ego or whatever, then I cannot speak honestly. I cannot speak and say, oh, Gilbert, you better not say that because so-and-so is going to get upset with you for saying this or, or doing this or talking about the esoteric or whatever. No, I can only speak as it naturally comes out. That's just the way it is. I can't filter it. I, I filter diplomatically and politically I try to do those things but in terms of the dharma it has to flow naturally and that's what he's talking about is is that that if the second thought is a sticky thought it messes everything up but it's not that we avoid the second thought it's that we avoid sticking to that thought so if you just let it go okay it's a donut fine move on nothing to see here nothing to taste it's you just keep going. It's not bad. Did that make sense to you? Uh, still struggling. Thank you. Yeah. Just uh, if you're with Guo uh, Xing Fashia, just, just uh, mention to him what I was saying, you know, so you can articulate it to him and, and see, you know, how, how he says it. Because it's, it's very important what, what he's talking about. And I've I've heard him talk in, in that way, use that example before. Um, and, and he's correct in terms of, of, of looking at it. So long as we see that, that it isn't necessarily the second thought arising is defiled. It is the second thought arising with the nature of, of an ego that is, is bad. But sequentially, the mind will have many, many thoughts. But it is the defiled ones which that stick to the ego that are the ones that are troublesome and create the idea of a life in being. So the only way that a life in being can create its existence is by constantly recertifying itself via thought. And so it's a conjurous trick. It's not real. But, it, it, but if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, then um, it will it will be in, in this way. You know, it, it's like the animal farm. If you keep saying, you know, two plus two is, is three or, uh, you know, people will begin to think in that way, you know, um, and they'll, they'll, they'll start doing that. But it isn't in that way. We, we tricked ourselves into believing into that kind of, a, of an illusory reality. And that's what he's talking about. He's trying to help you with that part. No. So, so uh, kind of re-listen to this and go back and talk to him. And I think he'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Lei Hui. Hi, Gilbert. Thank you so much for today's lecture. I enjoyed it very much. It was very interesting for me. I have a question because I'm reading the Diamond Sutra by Ray Pine, and there is this um, mention about the four precepts that bodhisattvas let go of, which are the self, being, life, and the soul. So my question is, why is the soul referenced here? 
I don't know how he he looks at it from from that viewpoint. The idea of soul, it, let's say in a Judeo Christian um, concept, is is something that is everlasting, that is uh, given on to the people by a deity, by God, that there is this soul. Uh, but but upon scrutiny and looking at it, it's it is fallacious in that that soul cannot be established in, in any kind of a way, because if we look at it and we say, okay, from the Christian way of looking at things, and, and I'm using Christian, but it wasn't Christian back then. Uh, it, they called heterodox views from different uh, religions from that viewpoint. I'm you only using Christianity simply because of the fact that it, it is contemporary and understandable more than than some of the religions at that point that were were around um, when when the Diamond Sutra was there. And so this idea of a soul is is something that if if we look at it and we say, well, if everything is created by God, then we cannot establish a separate reality to uh, to a soul apart from that, because that that is a dream of God. It, it's not real. And, and if it was real, it would have been there from the very beginning. So when we look at things and we judge the world and when we see things, this is why we talk about uh, sunyata uh, and, and this impermanence, because this impermanence is there and we see things as they are, not as they're preached, but as they are. And, and so this uh, transcends the idea of, of a religious uh, uh, dogma. It is looking at it and going, how can we prove this? And and so, and if we can't prove it, then we have to look and say, there must be something else there. And so it is, it is very difficult to do that, to establish this individual soul that continues on. The Buddhists do not believe in a transmigration of souls. Um, we are just simply a continuum. And sometimes I refer to it as transparent fishes in the ocean. And it's just more the current rather than an image of a, per, a, a particular person. But a particular person does not reincarnate. Even though we, we talk about that, there is no soul that reincarnates. There is just simply a continuum of, of the information, you could say, of, from the past of things that have been done, positive, negative, and neutral, that continue f what we perceive to be forward, but it's just simply moving, apparently moving, but not really. And so when we look at things, we see it from this kind of a viewpoint, this right view, and so we cannot use um, uh, this empirical logic to prove the soul. And that's why they're saying, you know, there is no soul. And it's important to understand that. It's not easy for us because Buddhists still believe in the transmigration of, so of souls sometimes because they'll say, oh, well, this person reincarnated into that. We see, and I see where people, let's say, used to be from the, from the heaven realm and are now in the human realm, but it's not the same person. They didn't, they don't have this international, you know, um, all time ID that they carry with them. It's just the, the current of the actions that brings forth an appearance again, but that appearance only applies to samsara. It's only valid in samsara once one awakens from the dream, there is no such thing. There is no person, no life and being there. We don't understand that. But that is very important for us to, to contemplate because that enables us to, to transcend the idea that this world is real versus the other way around where the world is not real, mind is real. But we don't know that. And next week, I'll, I'm going to be talking some more about this incredible power of the mind, um, which will fit right into the side illumination. You, I think you'll be um, very surprised about. Uh, I wish I could have gotten to it today, but I don't want to 
rush to things. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, Sensor's giving me the, the smile, which means it's time to go. So uh, thank you all. Uh, I hope I answered your question. If I didn't, Lay, please, you know, um, ask it again next time. You know, there's, there's uh, as you see, you know, I, I will answer all your questions, whether they're high level or low level or in between. There's no such thing as a low level question. Okay. So um, uh, practice well, try to do some sign illumination, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Amitofo.